so a lot of you probably already know something about Asurian. Uh, it was a search fund company that was about the size of many of the companies that are here in the room. But since the acquisition in 1992, they're at $8 billion in revenue, 1,600 employees, which, by the way, to put that in perspective, is about the same size as Facebook, 22 countries, 53 cities. We have with us three of the architects of that success, Kevin Tweel, Jim Ellis, and Gerald Risk. Uh, Kevin and Jim were both former case writers with Irv Grosbeck, as I was, so it's sort of something that we all share in common. Um, they, Kevin and Jim, both raised their search funds separately, which a lot of people don't realize. And they joined forces <coughs> later on after they were already in the search. And that's something I, I, I'm going to ask you a little bit about later on. Uh, Gerald joined Assuring a few years later after they had bought the company, uh, also a Stanford MBA. And later he worked his way up to being CFO and then president. Uh, how I got involved is one day Kevin called me up and asked if I'd like to invest in his search fund. And that was back in a day where I think maybe at that point there had been less, less than five search funds raised in total, and so you were desperate, so I was on the list. And I remember I didn't have any money at the time, and he bridged my finance, my search fund unit until I got my company sold so I could invest in Road Rescue. Thank you very much, by the way, for that. <laughs> But we're not going to talk about how to run a billion dollar company. Um, instead, I'm going to ask these guys to go back in time, 25 years, and see if we can't tease out some of the reasons why they are where they are. Lessons not on how to run a billion dollar company, but how to create a billion dollar company. Now, Assurian began much like all the companies in this room. Uh, in fact, you know, we sometimes forget that, uh, uh, that and not so long ago, Jim was reminding me of a story which I, I'm going to ask you to share with us. Uh, the company used to be called Road Rescue, 10 million in revenue, 75 employees. Most of them were truck drivers or call center employees. Uh, as I remember from our early board meetings, it was in industrial Houston, not exactly the fanciest place. Can you, would you just share with them a story so we can kind of set the stage for what Asurian or Road Rescue looked like in 1992? Was there a particular story? There was the story where the company sponsored a concealed weapon class and we had to fire our receptionist who carried a 38. There was the uh, <laughs> issue where somebody threw rocks through our window and Kevin and I had to answer calls all night. There was the fact that we had to repossess uh, uh, one of our tow trucks when our driver got drunk and passed out at a motel and uh, we had to go find him. There was the landlord that asked us to s uh, please have our employees stop having sex in the fire escape. Um, there was, um, so there's a lot of story. I mean, it started, I mean, we really did start kind of in a, in a business that was pretty raw. It was, I mean, a lot of the, we were, when we were looking at buying other companies, it was one of the things that a lot of people told us to stay away from in terms of towing and, it wasn't necessarily the, uh, we weren't working with, we were possibly the only MBAs that entered our business to, of towing cars the year that uh, we graduated. Yeah, so it was all glamour when they first had that business. <laughs> um, Kevin, I want to ask you, uh, you two didn't start out as partners. You met along the way. And many of us in the room have struggled with, do I want to run a company by myself or with a partner? I, I, I want to ask you, so how did that all come about? So uh, for most of you, this is, is probably too late um, since you already have partnered up or made that decision. But um, when I was going through the process of um, <clears throat> thinking about a search fund, um, I had already tried everything else, uh, thought about business plans and tried to start, a, thought about starting companies. And that didn't, nothing panned out there. So once I decided to do a search fund, I knew I was going to do it, uh, either solo or, um, or with a partner. And uh, I, I was certainly hell-bent on doing it one way or the other. <coughs> Strong preference um, to do it with a partner. Um, I know, <clears throat> I, I don't think there's any right answer. Um, and I think there are success stories across the spectrum or in both situations. But for me, the, um, the idea of a partner has some of the obvious benefits of sharing the highs and lows. Um, uh, you know, John Stanton talked earlier about the loneliness of being the CEO, and, and you obviously have less of that uh, with a partner. 
But uh, I think at its core, what really, um, why I really wanted a partner was just a, a belief that, you know, given the right opportunity, um, you can accomplish so much more as, uh, as partners than, than any one individual. So, so maybe building a little bit about, upon that, it was, what, a half a dozen years before Gerald joined, or was it? It was, what year was that? Three, nine Three years. years, yeah. Nine so, so you and Jim to come together, you both Stanford MBAs. The company is still pretty small, and now you add yet another Stanford MBA onto the team. What were you thinking? I mean, that feels like a lot of horsepower well, at we the top. Were th we, I mean, diversity was an issue. We were thinking about Harvard, but we decided to stay away from, from <laughs> that for a while. I, I'm not sure we've ever quite gotten that far. Um, it was not about another uh, Stanford MBA. It, it is, um, I um, hate to repeat what is, you guys have heard many times already today, but this idea of getting great talent. Um, uh, we were uh, fortunate enough to have learned that early on, and we were aiming high uh, for the uh, best candidate we could get uh, for that role. And uh, we, um, so it was, it was really less uh, about, you know, getting a specific Stanford MBA. I, I would, you know, from my experience, I'd say um, you should always go after that person no matter the cost. Um, I know there, particularly in smaller companies, there's always that trade-off, and if you're, you're talking to your board about the cost of that extra salesperson, I mean, for the right individual, particularly in the key slots, uh, I'd say in 99 out of 100 cases, maybe even, you know, a higher percent than that, you really can't pay that person enough because the it's really, it's really your company was small at the time that mm -hmm. Gerald joined. And the impact he had, I mean, not to you know, toot his horn in front of you know, everybody here while he's sitting right here, but uh, it's been, it was tremendous. I mean, one of the learnings Jim and I had early on was just the tremendous impact one mm -hmm. strong player can have. I mean, the, the converse is true as well. We, we learned that lesson. You, you make a bad hire in a key slot, it, it can take years and a lot of money to, to clean up that mess. Well, Gerald, so you got a degree here and you were, had a career in investment banking that was doing well. What was it about joining a roadside assistance towing company, working for two people who were essentially your peers? What was it about it that got Kevin and Jim to get you on board? Yeah. If you can remember back. I can. Um, <clears throat> so first, it fit with my career aspirations at the time. Um, I had you mean so being in the towing industry? In the towing industry, <laughs> um, and uh, <clears throat> so I was working at Goldman as an investment banker in San Francisco, and I'd really joined there, yes, to build skills in investment banking and maybe a career there, but really I joined with a view to using that as a century post to, to find an opportunity to be an entrepreneur. I'd come to Stanford like many people and didn't, maybe didn't really know what entrepreneurship was but was kind of interested in it and maybe like lots of people in this room, I didn't see myself as a startup entrepreneur and so I thought, well, how am I gonna be an entrepreneur if I don't, won't start a company and kind of kicked the tires on search funds but that wasn't a good fit for me so I thought, oh, I'll be, I'll join the senior team of a growth company, um, which seemed kind of unrealistic graduating from the business. Was, oh, I'll go back into banking and see where that leads, build skills and relationships and see where that leads. And so when Kevin called me um, out of the blue, it, I was like, oh, here's the, you know, I was very primed for the opportunity. It was really, oh, here's a, a growth company. And then I didn't look at Kevin and Jim and think of them as peers. I looked at them and thought, oh, here's two people who have, at this point, six or seven years of hard-won entrepreneurial uh, experience, uh, a great reputation. I thought, oh, here are two people I can learn uh, about being an entrepreneur from. And I looked at the board and I thought, my gosh, what a, I mean, what a great um, opportunity to kind of do a good job for these people. And, if you know if that's all that happens, that's you know that's a great outcome. And then I actually loved the contrarian nature of the decision. It just mm -hmm. sort of fits with my personality that that was 1998. And if you were leaving Goldman, if you were an associate at Goldman, you were leaving. You were leaving to be CFO of an internet startup. And I 
I just, it was like weirdly more appealing to me to, I'm gonna join a towing company that actually has cash flow. Uh, well, okay, but it was a towing company. So what was it about, if you can recall anything about the way Jim or Kevin positioned it that made it attractive for you? And the reason I'm asking is that you know, a lot of this is about attracting good talent. It's one thing to say, okay, I wanna, I wanna find my Gerald, but how do you get that somebody like that to join your company, especially the kinds of companies that, that we all have? Yeah. So, so building on some of what I or adding more specificity to some of what I just said, um, Kevin and Jim were very effective in um, painting a compelling vision for the company. Um, that yes, it was towing, but we were tied to, well, at that point we were still um, uh, yeah, chipping our pick on like insurance, but you know, they made a compelling, hey, this is why we're gonna take over towing for auto insurance. And we also had mobile and that actually seemed quite compelling too. So they painted a very uh, compelling story of where this company could go. Um, and it had validity because, oh, these, you know, these smart investors that I have, a, you know, that I don't know, but I have a lot of kind of implicit respect for back these guys and this growth story. And it just, it, it seemed very compelling. If I remember correctly, one, one of the things we really tried to present is we're bringing on another partner. You weren't necessarily there at the founding, but we didn't want somebody who was just going to be an employee who managed finance. We were really thinking about somebody who's gonna have thought leadership, play a role in the strategic direction. So I think a big part of the sale, at least it was yeah. our intent, was you're gonna have mm -hmm. impact. You're actually gonna have a founder-like role in the direction of the company. You're gonna have a pretty meaningful voice in that. You know, the, um, it, this <coughs> was brought up in one of the earlier sessions about you know, how do you sell this opportunity. And for Road Rescue, but I think, you know, in most cases, I mean, for people who will talk to you, um, assuming they've got some sort of entrepreneurial aspiration, I think we all have an amazing story. I mean, this is an opportunity for, um, for somebody often at a younger age to take on a bigger role, more responsibilities, and to be a, have a seat at the table at making the key decisions that will drive the company success or, or failure. And that's, um, that's a pretty heady uh, opportunity for anybody. Of course, there's an opportunity potentially to, to create wealth along the way, um, but to have that seat at the table, to be able to make those key decisions, you know, uh, folks at that age coming in, you know, working in mid-size or larger companies just don't have that opportunity. So Jim, um, you know, I'm sure there are people in the room that are kind of sold that, boy, if I could find somebody like Gerald or later, we're gonna talk about Brett Camoli, who, who they recruited later, I would do that, but I don't know how to find that person. And I think there's kind of a mythology that these people just sort of fell in your lap along the way. What, what do you recall from how you and Kevin used to find talent, and then maybe bring it to a day of, you know, an age of LinkedIn and social media and so forth, so that we've got something that we can work from? Yes, I, I would say the most valuable resource that we've had in terms of attracting the best talent has been the network that we individually developed, the Stanford network. Um, if you look at Brett, who we'll talk about, who was, a, who was a GSB grad, Gerald certainly, our current, we've announced who the next CEO is, uh, Tony, who will be, um, who's a GSB grad. So I think early on, I think we abdicated some of the hiring process to recruiters when we would hire somebody and then kind of say the pros are here, we'll vet the candidates, but really left it in their hands. And I think we found oftentimes those produced candidates that, that weren't, didn't have the tenure with us, that didn't have the impact. And I think when we found people through our network and put them through that process, that we ended up with much better folks. So I would say a lot of our key players came from networking, just making sure that you tell everybody out there what it is that you're looking for in terms of talent. I think starting, when you start to develop a reputation that you allow people to make decisions and have impact beyond their past experience that we weren't looking for somebody. I mean, Gerald is a perfect example, coming on as, as CFO when he had never had a CFO or a controller role before, I think meant people were kind of stepping in with some of the weird aspects of being a towing company um, because they had more opportunity. So I think presenting the opportunity the right way, I think leveraging your network. And, and I think lastly, I think a lot of places where we made mistake in hiring is we kind of went through this search fatigue and we would hire and we'd say we had six months for a search and at the end of the search you just hire whoever the last person was 
uh, on the list, and I think most of the time we ended up really disappointed in those. So I think it's kind of keeping it going, particularly for key positions, until you find folks. And, and for us, it's been huge success through the, through the Stanford network. And despite what Kevin said, we've actually hired a few people from Harvard. So um, uh, you touched on an interesting point, which is that, of course, you know, we can talk about the people that worked out, but there were a lot of people that you hired that didn't work out. What, what sort of process did you have to try to make sure that if you made a mistake, you dealt with it quickly? Or, di or did you early on? No, we were terrible. Yeah. I, mean, we, I mean, I think we, we had one person who, you know, we kind of joked that, that uh, he eventually became vice president of special projects. And a career <laughs> advice, when you become the vice president of special projects, <laughs> You're past your expiration date. Um, it just meant it just meant that we weren't willing to pull the trigger, and we kind of passed uh, it on from department to department. So I think we eventually learned to get better. I think the toughest thing is actually making the decision as to when is the right right time to to part ways. And I think over time we've become better, done a lot better job at specifying what the expectations are for results, not just resume and what that looked like, but for impact and results. And when and when those things don't work out, oftentimes if presented the right way, the, the person in the position knows that they haven't delivered and those decisions become easier and it becomes quicker. And I think it's part of that discipline um, that actually took, took a long time. I mean, all of, our mis all of those mistakes were mm -hmm. always letting somebody go too late and it was unfair to them. I mean, we've even had situations where we've called people up and said, can you have lunch? And had them call back and say, I was thinking about putting a deposit on a piece of property this afternoon. Should I do that or should I wait till after launch? I mean, clearly, it, clearly it was terrible management on our part that that person was coming to work every day knowing that they were underperforming and just waiting for that phone call. So I think we got a lot better. You did it at lunch? We did. I, <laughs> I, I suggested that he may not want to put that deposit down. I, the first time I uh, had to terminate somebody, I didn't want to do it in the office, so I went down the street to McDonald's. <laughs> and that seemed to work out okay. So the second time I had to terminate somebody, I went back to McDonald's. I didn't realize a word got around the company that if anybody, if Dodd's <laughs> nasty to McDonald's, you're going to get fired. Uh, Kevin, you were going to add something? Yeah, yeah, I was going to add to that. Um, you know, John Stanton mentioned that earlier today that you know, we always, or many of us, fire, you know, take too long to fire. And I wanted to ask him what he has done. Um, over time to, to improve his average there, to, to, do, to shorten the period of time. And, and, and we didn't, we've thought about this a lot and haven't really come up with any rocket science other than um, what we uh, try to do every day, which is build a relationship with our employees, our, our team members, and have a constant conversation with them so that the expectations of them are known and you're giving them feedback. They get the feedback, both the positive and the constructive feedback. And through that process, uh, I've found that the, the time it takes to uh, get somebody who's not the right person uh, on your team off the team, um, it's just, it goes a lot quicker just because mm -hmm. you're having that conversation at regular intervals. Um, but I, uh, we haven't found any other great mechanism to, to shorten that, that process. Gerald, I wanted to ask you, and you may not know this off the top of your head, but I remember about two years ago, you showed me a slide in a presentation about the key hires and the different networks they came out of. And I don't remember the exact number, but it was some really sort of remarkable number that had come out of Kevin's network over time. Do you remember anything of, of the data on that slide? Well, the, sl the slide was probably, you know, Kevin's direct reports at the time. And it just, it just sort of data backing up Jim's comment about right. the Stanford network is that there are probably seven direct reports and five of them were from Stanford and um, and one or t so probably four or, uh, four were from Stanford two were from our professional network over time at Assurian like clients we'd worked with or people Brett knew you know had gotten to know at the CTIA and then one was through a recruiter I remember watching as you were building the team uh, how much you had drawn upon your network as a result, you know, to find these sorts of people. Which kind of brings me to the issue of Brett Camoli. Now, Brett, Brett's not with us today, but he was hired on as uh, president and then CEO of the company. And so Ashurian- He was brought on directly as CEO. Direct, well, I'm gonna get to that actually, okay, yeah, because, actually. so, so Ashurian was maybe a half a dozen or 10 years 
into it since you had bought it at the time? Five? Uh, five, five. Okay, five, so five, five or six. six. Yeah. You've already brought on Gerald. Company's doing well, maybe 1,000 employees, something like that, but it, but it was doing better, and, and, and we knew that it was going to be successful. And then you bring on somebody else, and this is a little bit different than when you brought on Gerald. And when, when the two of you brought on Gerald, you were sort of building out your direct reports. This is quite different. You brought on Brett Camoli, and you said, no, I'm going to step away as CEO. You run the company now. I think a lot of us would have trouble doing that because we would say, well, things are, things are successful. Things are doing well. Can, and, and I do remember in the board meeting being honestly a little perplexed, and I couldn't figure out if you had lost confidence or what was going on. So tell us a little, it turned out to be an incredibly wise move. Tell us a little bit about your wisdom around that. Well, it, it, uh, I don't recall it exactly the same way, David. Um, the, uh, um, Jim and I wanted to, to bring on um, uh, you know, Brett onto the team, and you can share some of your thoughts on this in a second, Jim. Um, we, um, he was a, just an amazing talent, and we had initially scoped this as a COO uh, role. Well, Brett, given his experience and his prior um, roles, we were never going to get him without the CEO title. And it wasn't that he, um, I don't even recall him putting up uh, that as a barrier per se, mm -hmm. um, that's just not Brett. Uh, but we knew we wanted him, we knew how talented he was, we knew what, what kind of value he could add and we wanted to bring him onto the team. So, so Jim and I talked about it and uh, we were, were comfortable um, giving him the CEO title. W where I differ uh, from your, um, uh, your, what you said is it was never, to turn it over to Brett to, to run the company. It was really, you know, this was at a time where Jim was transitioning um, out of the business and uh, we were looking for really uh, a partnership. Um, and to me, it was, the titles were really less important. It was, I was looking for a partner to, you know, replicate the, the partnership that, that I had with Jim for the prior six, seven years. And you know, in retrospect, I think it was a, an incredibly risky move. I mean, incredibly. I mean, to, to bring somebody in from the outside, um, I and wouldn't try to fill his shoes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's just you've got a company, you've got a culture, and bringing in somebody from the outside at that senior level is always, uh, I think, a pretty risky uh, endeavor. You know, as, as you know, as we thought about it, as I thought about it, the, the real key was how we're Brett and I going to work together. And um, you know, certainly one is um, I wanted to emulate the communication that Jim and I had, which was uh, not daily, it was multiple times a day. Um, we would talk uh, at length, uh, you, know, you know, in very short spurts, um, and, and the, um, it, was, it was almost like a continuous flow, and uh, I was hopeful that Brett and I would get there, and we ultimately did, or we did almost right away. And then I think the, the, the telltale sign for me in a partnership is whether, um, the other person is pulling you in or pushing you away and you know, really concerned about his or her sandbox. And this, these are my roles and responsibilities. That's, that's to me, that's a, you know, a, not, not a yellow flag, it's a red warning flag. Um, and you know, I think uh, great partnerships are built on one person asking for advice, pulling the other person in. You, you have clear delineated roles and responsibilities, right. but you want the other person. Yeah, that's a really input. interesting metric. And, and Brett was the, the right person, I mean, in, a, in so many different ways. I mean, look, and first of all, we've never been titles. I mean, we literally flip coins for titles, for offices, for all the rest of that stuff. So they're really those decisions. That, that is actually no joke. We were uh, at the uh, SFO, <laughs> right. and we were trying, we were going to an investor meeting. Was it Jim Southern? Jim Southern. Yeah, I think we were going to And we're like, Jim is not going to let us get yeah, away Jim, Jim's unless gonna we know gonna our He's going to ask his question. Jim's going to ask us his question. And uh, we were at a pay phone. Do you guys remember those? They were like pay phones. Um, and uh, we called her for advice. And uh, I think he, he gave two pieces of advice. One is, um, you know, skip the CEO title. Just have one president, one chairman, and flip a coin. And we flipped it right then and there. That was it? Um, but in terms of Brett, we've never been sensitive, so there really wasn't a lot of territory, certainly between the, the, the two of us. And look, we had, the company had grown so fast. So by the time Brett came on, I think we were $300 million in revenue. We, were, we went from 
70 employees to 1,500 employees. And I think a lot of that growth, we had really gang tackled a lot of problems, new contracts, new markets, new products, or whatever it is. And I think we had way outgrown organizational structures, systems, processes. So we spent a lot of time building the business, but less time building the organization. And the next stage, it just wasn't going to work, right? I mean, it's, it's not force of will and personal connections. It really has to be much more structured. And Brett, look, he was second in his class from West Point. He had been a CEO before. He had a lot of the things that we felt were not necessarily things we spent a lot of time on or were particularly interested in or maybe not even very good at. And, and Brett kind of came on and really created a lot of the structure and organization that had been lacking. I mean, well, look, I, I can say it probably we probably shouldn't have spent time on that. We maybe waited a little bit too long, but we definitively needed it by the time Brett stepped into that yeah. role. By the way, the story goes that uh, Brett did a semester at uh, the Air Force Academy where they didn't give A pluses. So we had all A pluses at West Point. His competitor had all A pluses at West Point, and he had <coughs> one A only because the Air Force Academy <coughs> didn't, didn't give, give A, a pluses. pluses. So, so Gerald, I want to switch gears a little bit. We've talked, to, we've been talking about why you might bring talent on and uh, why it's important. So once they're on board, I want to talk a little bit about culture and values and how you motivate people like that. And I know that you've, I've, I've heard you mention the phrase divine discontent. Well, tell us a little bit about what that means and also how you get people to aspire to divine discontent. Yeah, so <clears throat> divine discontent is, um, <coughs> Our branding of some of the themes that you've heard today, just kind of a feeling that a dissatisfaction with the status quo, a desire to get better, um, kind of a, a personality that's drawn, it, it draws inspiration from the next milestone, not sort of past achievement. Um, and, and just over time, divine discontent became our branding for that concept and a cultural value. That to, the divine discontent itself, we stole um, the label, we stole from an article, a friend of mine, uh, like six months into the job, he faxed it to me. Um, so uh, he didn't email it to me, I don't know if we, well, probably had email, but I, I literally think he faxed it to me. Um, it was an article from the McKinsey Quarterly written by this guy, uh, David Kirk, who had been captain of the, of the 1984 New Zealand All Blacks rugby team, which, you know, sort of, um, at, at the time was sort of the best rugby team ever. And he was captain of that and went on. He was a Rhodes Scholar and blah, 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 worked at McKinsey. And then they asked him to do a speech at one point about um, running world-class teams. And, uh, and then he reduced his speech into this article. And one of the things he talked about was the mindset of the team, and he labeled it divine discontent, and how they looked at competitors mm -hmm. not as a way to they wanted to thrash their competitors, but they really didn't look at it as victory per se. They looked at it as a, any competition as a way of measuring themselves against their own standards. And there's other stuff in the article, but that was sort of divine discontent. And I read it and I was like, you know, and I kind of walked down the hall to Kevin's office and showed it to him. And we just, it just resonated with us and like this reflects our personality uh, and kind of what, you know, on our best days, what we want to try and create here. And over time, it just became, you know, it was in the water. We actually created a, I mean, we have operating principles and core values, and this is one of our core values, divine discontent. Uh, and we found it to be highly functional. Um, and the reason it was highly functional is that it gets, it, you know, we paired it with, with we, it just was a great way for people to engage in how do we make things better without being defensive. Um, so we could say, I could go into my, into the CFO's office when I was president and sort of say, what does the finance organization look like at full potential? And it's not like, you know, I don't think that, you know, I don't think that guy's very good or I don't think, you know, our AP is up to snuff, but it's a totally different question to say, what does this look like if it's really awesome? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and that just became very, it led to a lot of comfortable, you know, led to very comfortable conversations about how we can get better. Jim, you've also, along with divine discontent. By the way, I might yeah. add one thing yeah, is, um, 
So I got that article in 1999 and it uh -huh. became part of, you know, company, you know, it was like our core values. And so probably in 2013 or 2014, Kevin and I were in Hong Kong and we're trying to uh, recruit um, this guy, David Moffat, to be the chairman of our Australian business. And he, he had been the number two guy at Telstra. So, you know, again, like aspirations to attract great people to our company, to like a startup, you know, like we didn't have anything in Australia. And he asked us to talk about our values. So we talked about our values and we start, and we tell him about this story. And he kind of lights up and he's like, I know David Kirk, he's a friend of mine. And so the next day we walk into the office and he's, he's like, hey, because he was meeting us in the office the next day. And we walk in and David Moffat says, hey, Kevin, Gerald, come over here. And we, and we go into a conference room and he calls David Kirk and he introduces us and, and he says that, you know, here are these two Canadian guys running this American company and they, they read your article and it's all part of, you know, it's all, and he's like, you guys might be the only ones who read that article. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad it's had such a big impact on you. That's good. So uh, another one of your core values is, is focus on the core. Uh, focus what's on most important. I think you call it focus on the core, right? So Jim, I want to ask you, I mean, I think we sort of generally know what that means. A little bit about the struggle to, to make that happen. I think it would be all hands would go up if I said, does everybody think it's important to focus on the core? But how did you actually make that happen? So I think there's a couple of things, in particular early on, I wouldn't say that we were very good at it. I mean, I think if you asked us if we had priorities, we'd, we'd tell you, yeah, we, we did. But I think the real issue is how do you end up allocating your time and your resources differently is, is really the tough part. Saying this is really important and then changing behavior I think is really hard. One example, and we had a, it was a Stanford GS beer who was running a piece of the, of the business and he always seemed to be majoring in the minors. And you know, you'd sit down with him and you'd ask him, what's your priorities? And he would give you a list of 40 things. And they were probably in the right order, but he didn't change the way he got up in the morning and what he did. And now certainly there's gonna be forces that drive you throughout the day and distract you, but I think we've really tried to internalize, identify what's the most important thing for the company. Most of, it, most of the time for us early on, it was externally focused and kind of internalize that as a, as a real value. So we're a client-centric company and kind of talk about it in that way. So I think that changes a little bit your mindset. I, I think number two, a lot of the people that are in this room, pr probably everybody, is a little bit of an overachiever. And I think there's some uh, type A personality and there's a little bit of a resistance to something's my responsibility and on my plate. And I feel like I, it's my responsibility to spend time and attention on that. Whereas when you're in, a seat, in the CEO seat, as you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to approach absolutely everything with equal level of enthusiasm and energy. It's actually inappropriate, right? I mean, if we got two or three things right, it was gonna dramatically drive value. All the other things we could do correctly, but if we didn't get those three things right, it didn't matter how well the other things kind of came together. We wanted to do an, a good job on them. And, and I think that the other thing is that there's a level of discomfort early in your career that I'm not spending time on that. And I think the priorities, what we've tried to drive the organization to even at the individual level is, it's, it's as much about the things that you don't do as it is the things that you spend time on. And how do you, how do, you do that, I think, you know, you, you have those conversations early in your career with the board, they help you make sure you've got the right priorities, ask the tough questions about how, do you, how are you spending your time, whether it's on team or product or company. And um, I, I think having that confidence to make that time allocation decision, I think is one of the tough parts that happens in somebody's career. And this is something I'll turn over to Kevin because he's probably the best person I've ever seen at this. Um, but Kevin, ever since, I, I just remember ever since it was, I don't know, since the 90s when we were working together, there was always one or two post-its on his computer screen. And they were kind of guiding principles. Do I return that call? Do I answer that email when I pick up the phone when somebody says, hey, can you come into a meeting? And it was usually renew a contract or fund this or deal with this problem or hire this position. But there weren't 10, there were one or there were two. And just making sure that when you, the way you spend your time, certainly over a day there's gonna be distractions. So if it's not 80, 20 on your top priorities over the day, but it, it better be over the month and it certainly be, better be over the quarter and it definitely has to be that way over the year. And I think a lot of times you just get distracted by all those kind of micro decisions yeah. that seem like it's only gonna be 10 minutes. But you know, 
20 so or 30 of those, and, it, and all of a sudden you're not spending, to, you're not focusing on the core. Okay, so I think it takes this. Yeah, please. Can I add on? Yeah, the, um, I, think, uh, I think one of the things we did do well was prioritize, and I think that was born out of um, our partnership and, and spending a lot of time talking about it and then um, and getting advice from, from our, uh, our board members in particular. And uh, just to put a point on what Jim said, uh, when we took over uh, Road Rescue, uh, with the help of the board, we identified that the, the real leverage in this, op in this business was going to be taking advantage of the revenue opportunity that faced us. And so uh, Jim and I, if you call 100, we had 100% of our time each, um, approximately at least 150% of our time Collect was spent, collectively was spent on uh, revenue generation, either current uh, or new clients. And we recognized that operationally we could have been more efficient, uh, we could have done a, a better job there, but we, we, uh, we put a capable person in charge and um, we were okay with it being at a certain level of quality for a period of time while we focused on that. Yeah, I, I, somebody uh, referred to you once as being extraordinarily good at kind of walking past unimportant messes and staying focused on what's important. I think so, Kevin is, I, 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 and I'm gonna use this word because I've thought about it. He's ruthless about how he spends his time. So, so we've spent, we've talked about recruiting. That means and, you should return that email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> recruiting, finding talent, reaching high. Uh, Gerald, you talked a little bit about making sure that everybody is thinking in a certain way, and, and Jim, you and Kevin talked about getting everybody going in the same direction. So I've got this vision of this really outstanding team who's headed all together thinking the same thing, or roughly the same thing. But I, I feel like you have another part of the team here, which were not your employees, but your, your network and your investors. And I, I've never seen anybody use their investors better than you did, especially in those you know, initial 10 years. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of, I've got, this, I've got this narrative in my head that you would see a problem and you would ask yourself, well, can I just pick up the phone and get the answer? And if I can do that, I don't need to solve it on my own. But that's my, that's my own narrative. By the way, it's funny you pose a question that way because today I find I spend most of my time trying to ensure that our senior team is actually aligned and heading in the same direction. <laughs> it is so freaking tough. It, it is, it's sort of amazing that um, you, you need to continue to, um, to share the message and, and, and the direction. Um, uh, early on, uh, Jim and I made um, liberal um, use of uh, our board members' willingness to reach out and uh, offer to, uh, for us to reach out to them. And, and David uh, was uh, one of our board members and probably recalls uh, frequently, Jim and I, probably on a weekly basis, um, reaching out to at least one of our board members. And <clears throat> we, um, uh, what gave us confidence to do that um, that we weren't asking silly questions was uh, that we would test it against each other first. At least it gave us a little bit more confidence because I know um, being in that seat alone, I'd worry about, okay, is this really silly? And, and would I look stupid in front of our board? Uh, I, I think that what we came to find was um, our board was so open and willing to help us and wanted to help us. And, and what we found was what we thought was a thorny issue for a board member is a 30 second answer. I mean, once you've seen something four or five, six times, it's the, the questions that you may have had, the, the, the gray area sort of falls away because you, you have the data and, and you, you sort of understand that. Um, we have tried to build that into the organization in, a, um, in an interesting way. Um, and it, it really ties to what Jim was saying about prioritizing. So it, 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 we couple prioritization with uh, collaboration and the idea of getting help from the right people. And for maybe a half a dozen big issues every year, whether it's a, a contract renewal or we're trying to save a client or, or something like that, or a product introduction, we'll bring together half a dozen or eight of the uh, right people who, uh, who can bring information and um, information to bear on this problem. And we'll have one to four sessions. It could be three to four hours long. A lot of information and data is provided beforehand so everybody comes prepared. And we'll have what we call <coughs> uh, one or, or more of our power of 10 sessions. And that sounds really simple. It sounds really easy. but you are prioritizing. 
um, something, as Jim just said, most people ultimately don't do really well. They tend to move things along at the same level. And you're preparing for it, and you're collaborating. And it has surprised me every single time we've done it. Um, their quality of alternatives and ultimate solutions we come up with when you, um, when you provide that kind of structure around basically what is essentially uh, a little bit of prioritization and a lot of just getting advice. Yeah, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of lessons in the way the three of you would pulse your network and get advice and fast forward through the easy stuff so you could focus on really growing the company. And I think two um, things in particular that we did that made us more effective at that. Number one, um, and now being on the other end, the receiving calls for, for advice. I think number one, we tried to make it time efficient and easy for the person to give us advice. So it wasn't a rambling conversation, it was structured discussions um, with the facts that we thought were needed. And the other thing was we didn't try to sell. So we really didn't try to come into those situations asking for advice, where really what we were trying to do was sell a board member, an investor, or an advisor on a position that we believed in. Um, we tried to take a position where we're generally open and the questions weren't, you know, the response wasn't if we disagree with it, why about that, you know, no, but we think this. It was, why do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that? It was a lot of the, the kind of why, why, why until you, until you really Big got answer. good advice. If you look back in your early uh, career as a manager, maybe those first five or so years, was there a, a, an inflection point or sort of an aha moment where you changed and matured as a manager that those of us in the room might be able to benefit from and maybe get there a little faster? Um, so there are many. Um, and you know, so I've been in Sherman 18 years, um, you know, three titles, but probably had 30 jobs during that time, just how much. Um, and, and so my goal has always been to sort of be within two weeks of the job description on either side, hopefully two weeks ahead, hopefully not two week, more than two weeks behind. And I remember distinctly, like sort of four, maybe it was four years in or five years in, kind of Kevin did me the favor. He didn't say it exactly this way, but he's like, you know, you might be four weeks behind the job description. You know, you might wanna, <laughs> you might wanna catch up a little bit. And, uh, and so we like brainstorm, okay, so how might I do that? And we kind of together like, oh, let's call, you know, a board member and maybe they can, and so actually I remember calling Jeff Chambers and who's the best CFO you've ever worked with? Um, and he said, this guy, and, and can you introduce me to him? And so I went and spent the day um, with the CFO, but actually it turned out I spent 10 minutes with him, but he set me up with each one of his direct reports. And I think I had eight meetings and they were each like 45 minutes. And I literally took like eight pages of notes and that was like my playbook for the next you know, I was, oh, that's what a CFO does. I had no idea. <laughs> that's a, that's I was already on the job four years, so. <laughs> no, that's a, that, that's a great story, and obviously something you could do early on. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, somebody else could maybe do that, you know, first day on the job, so. Jim. Yeah, I mean, I think, there was a, I think there was a point in the career of managing people where you kind of felt like you needed to be responsible, mm -hmm. and I think there was that shift where, you know, a big piece of my job is actually to learn from and harness the talent that's in the room. And it's not about me being a manager, but it's about me being a facilitator of other people's mm -hmm. success. And I think that fundament, I think the people that you work with recognize that and respect it. I mean, you still have responsibility for evaluating performance and making sure you get the right people on the team. But I think when you kind of viewed it as, you know, I'm the coach trying to help get the yep. team to that point. I think it's a very different management approach as opposed to I'm going to manage your to-do list and, and all the rest of this. It's kind of confidence, but it's also learning. It's, it's, a, it's a level of self-awareness and self-comfort that you're willing to learn from the people who know a lot more about their particular job than you do. Great. All right, Kevin, last word. Uh, the, the things I, I learned early on were um, that uh, – were surprising to me was just, and I mentioned them both earlier, just the, the value of, of bringing on a, a tremendous talent like Gerald. Uh, number two was um, <clears throat> the, uh, the real effect and impact you have by experimenting, just the, the, the power of that um, and the, the need to always be doing it. But as I thought about um, the first five years and, and most transformative uh, moment 
um, and you may remember this, David, you were there, um, because this really impacted the trajectory of the business um, for the next 20 years. This was in, in uh, I think, 1999. We were at uh, the board meeting at Southwest Freeway in Houston, and Jim and I and Gerald were there, and we were, um, you know, tentative, and uh, we were bringing this big proposal to the board. It was um, cell phone insurance or handset protection, and we, we wanted to propose to the board that we buy this uh, little cell phone insurance company. And we were, you know, um, you know just sort of uncertain of ourselves, a little insecure, and, and we put it on the table, and there was a little debate back and forth, and then you know, all of a sudden, Bill Egan stands up and says, this is the best business ever. It's like, this is an amazing, isn't that what you said, Bill? <laughs> no, actually, the, so, yeah. so the, the actual story is, Bill's like, what is this? Who would ever buy this product? <laughs> this is the craziest idea ever. Is that it? Yeah. Except, except for you didn't use the word crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so th that was a transformational conversation. Yeah, yeah th <laughs> Bill, that's how I remember it as well. Um, so it would be easy to have you up here because you bought this company and it's it's the largest company that's come out of the search fund model. But and that's part of the reason they're here. But the other part of the reason is how they got there. And Kevin touched on a little bit about it. But everything that these guys did had ethics and values, they did it the right way, they didn't behave in any way that would leave them to be embarrassed, and then tactically, they, every move on the chessboard, not every move, but most of the moves on the chessboard were skillful management, and that more than anything is why we're lucky to have the three of them up there. So, big round of applause for my friends. <laughs>